So at this point, I'll introduce our speaker. Mike Palco is the Biomass Energy Specialist for Pennsylvania's Bureau of Forestry. He promotes the use of biomass, especially low-use wood, for the generation of small distributed heat and electricity for use in schools, hospitals, government buildings, and businesses. He evaluates biomass energy opportunities for assurance that any given project will have an adequate fuel supply at a level that protects the sustainability of the Commonwealth's natural resources. Mike has over 30 years of experience in forest resource management. He graduated from Penn State University, serves on its board of directors for uh, the Pennsylvania Biomass Energy Association, and is the chairman for the Pennsylvania Fuels for Schools and Communities program. Today, he'll be presenting on the status of the Bureau of Forestry's Wood to Energy Initiative and where it stands in Pennsylvania. Mike will highlight some of the benefits of biomass energy and some of the projects installed at schools, hospitals, sawmills, and greenhouses in recent years. So Mike, I'll turn it over to you and you can take it away. Thank you, Sarah. I hope everyone can hear me uh, adequately. I'm using a smart board and it's quite a nice piece of technology. I'm here in Williamsport, Pennsylvania in the county uh, courthouse. As Sarah was introducing me, uh, let me advance here. Uh, she mentioned the mission or the, uh, the intent of the Bureau of Forestry's wood energy program. Uh, yes, we have a, a mission to establish the small decentralized uh, thermal energy projects in, various, in its various forms at schools, hospitals, greenhouses, uh, a number of other uh, applications, in, uh, the, especially in the agriculture and the uh, forest uh, products industry. Using uh, low value, low use wood, low value timber, uh, mill residue, and short rotation woody crops. What I like to do is give uh, examples of that throughout, the, throughout today's talk. Uh, there are a lot of reasons. Uh, I won't go into a lot of detail here because I think many of you are aware of uh, the reasons for doing biomass energy or alternative energy uh, uh, processes. But one of the, the most basic is that it saves money. Uh, if you look at the production of energy on a million BTU basis, how much does it cost per, to produce a million BTUs of energy? If you look at oil, it's up around $34. If you uh, use propane, it's around $28 per million BTU. So as you come down in, the, in that list, wood pellets, for instance, would be around 18. Natural gas, Around, uh, currently it's around nine dollars and wood is around five. Coal has traditionally been below four dollars. So you can see there are there are various uh, there's a hierarchy to producing uh, uh, various forms of energy. Wood is one of the cheapest and because it's so abundantly available in Pennsylvania there are 17 million acres of forests in Pennsylvania it's uh, abundantly available. It's a feedstock that we can put into a wood wood fueled boiler that is locally produced, and and the revenue generated in producing that fuel stays in that local economy. So that is a benefit, and it's renewable. We can always grow a tree. You know, you've heard this before. You you can't grow another gallon of oil or another ton of coal, not in this lifetime anyway. So it's renewable, done properly using proper uh, best management practices, we can, we can produce wood on a, a sustainable, renewable uh, fashion. It utilizes wood residue. Uh, we, we have one of the largest forest products industries in the nation. Pennsylvania has long enjoyed for decades the, uh, the status of being the number one lumber producing state in the nation. So we produce a lot of wood residue. Rather than landfill it, or let it in a pile. Whenever I was a young boy, you know, back in the 60s, there were piles of sawdust out in the woods. We'd drive by them and, and gain permission, and we would take that home for mulch. You can't find that today because that residue is now finding other uses, other alternative uses. 
Using wood for energy also diversifies our energy portfolio. Pennsylvania has an alternative energy portfolio standard that encourages us as a commonwealth to produce so much of our energy used from alternative means like solar, wind power, but also biomass energy using wood as that fuel. Uh, biomass energy is carbon neutral. The argument is that you know trees take in carbon dioxide as they produce, uh, as they photosynthesis, uh, go through photosynthesis. Well, that carbon in the carbon dioxide is laid down and, and is used in the roots and to lay down wood in the growth of that tree. So we're taking the belief, the current belief is we're taking carbon out of the atmosphere and putting it into wood or into the soil as carbon. So there are benefits there. And of course, the last is benefits to the environment. As we do best management practices, sustainable forestry, we're, we're taking the unacceptable growing stock, that low value timber, we, we like to call it low use wood today. We're taking that low use wood and finding a, a use for it as an energy fuel, an energy production fuel. You can also use it, continue using it for pulp and paper or using that low grade timber to uh, to produce panel board, uh, medium density fiber board or particle board. Uh, but, but using it as a boiler fuel, it definitely has its benefits. So this is what it looks like. Uh, someone with a chainsaw cuts down a tree or a mechanized piece of uh, harvesting equipment, put that log on a, on a head saw to produce quality forest products. Or Take those unacceptable trees that will never produce a good board, put it through a chipper, produce chips. In the bottom left picture you see uh, a pellet mill in central Pennsylvania. They, they produce fuel pellets. And then uh, on the right, there's a plantation of hybrid willow. That's part of that short rotation woody crop initiative to, to grow our, our biomass. Harvest it when it's one and a half, two inches in diameter. and uh, and use that as boiler fuel. We have an example in Pennsylvania. I'll show you some pictures here in a little while of uh, the Hughesville High School. <clears throat> Basically, this picture takes something that looks like the upper left picture and get it into something that looks like the lower left picture. That's an AFS energy system, a large boiler. I'd like to, I'm going to touch base uh, or give you an introduction to some of the smaller thermal production boilers that we're seeing employed in Pennsylvania. I'll go through some examples. But basically, this is what biomass energy is. In Pennsylvania in 2014, I'll go through a list very quickly of uh, just to give you a flavor of who is using, what is using wood chips and other uh, biomass fuels in Pennsylvania to produce this thermal energy that, uh, that I, I claim that we need. School districts. There are four. Uh, excuse me. There are twelve school districts in Pennsylvania uh, using wood chips. Uh, one Benton, you see there, is using wood pellets uh, to heat their schools. Various configurations. Central Crawford, there on the top of the list, you can see they're not only heating the high school, but they also heat the pool, the new pool that they have, the admin building, and they're generating some electricity with their wood chips as well. Um, East Lake Homing, very unique, very progressive school district, heating their high school with a Messersmith boiler, but also they, they have grown almost 50 acres of hybrid willow. This past February, they harvested their first crop, one-third of their plantation, chipped it. The chips amounted to round, round chunks of stem about the size of your thumb. They put it through their boiler with no problem. Uh, and they mixed it, uh, used it just like their regular wood, wood chips to produce heat for the, for the high school. So I said they're progressive. Just imagine that. They're growing their own crop, their own fuel, and they, right next to their, their plantation, they have two and a half acres of uh, solar panels. They have an array producing 600 kilowatts of electricity. That's half the electricity that that high school needs. So look how sustainable, how they're reaching sustainability, growing their fuel, producing their own electricity. Uh, there are other examples there. Uh, I, I mentioned Benton, 
they're using wood pellets. Uh, they're using wood pellets to uh, heat that that high school. And I'm encouraged that uh, as we as we uh, encourage other approach other school districts, and with the uh, funding availability, the grant funding that's available, we can encourage other schools to uh, employ wood chip. Uh, wood wood fueled boilers to heat their facilities as well. There are three hospitals in Pennsylvania. Warren State Hospital, they've been using wood since the early 1990s to heat 40 buildings there in North Warren. Uh, Evangelical Community Hospital is one of the most recent uh, in Lewisburg. They're even generating some uh, electricity when when that production works. And then Elk Regional Health System, about eight years ago they went, uh, maybe not quite eight years ago, they went with a wood chip boiler. They had one of the most significant cost savings at the time. They also have natural gas, so I think that, to be honest, Elk Regional may be switching back and forth with natural gas. But uh, it's always a good thing to have two alternatives, two, two forms of energy to uh, call upon. Greenhouses, Espen Shades is another uh, another greenhouse down near Lancaster, northern Lancaster County, producing some electricity. The uh, nice thing there, they have 17 acres of greenhouse under glass that they are heating with wood chips. Very nice operation. Twin Springs Fruit Farm is one of the, the most recent, uh, west of Gettysburg. I'll show you some pictures uh, to highlight what they're doing. Then, of course, Dillon Floral in Bloomsburg and uh, Village Acres. Village Acres is a, is a very small application. It's an organic greenhouse in Mifflin Town, but uh, they're part of a, a concept known as community supported agriculture, where members of that co-op would will pay in advance and then every month during the production season, and I believe it's year-round, because they're heating their greenhouse throughout the winter, every month those participants would receive a, a large box of vegetables, produce, uh, as part of their uh, part of their uh, organization there, their, their co-op with that greenhouse. Uh, these small applications, such as Village Acres, I'm going to show you here in a little while, that is a, a terrific opportunity for biomass, wood energy in Pennsylvania. More on that in a little while. And then the last on the list there is Bloomsburg University. They're heating their, their campus there in Bloomsburg with a wood chip boiler. What they had was five coal boilers. They took two offline. They took them out, actually removed them, and put in a, a wood chip heating system for the base load to heat the campus. And then uh, their peaking demand and uh, shoulder months when they didn't need quite as much heat they use a natural gas, new natural gas boiler. And the recent report I have is that they are going to take out the third coal boiler and put in another, a second wood chip boiler to increase their base load capacity. So it's a nice development there for, for Bloomsburg, continuing to demonstrate that in these larger applications, it's actually a district heating concept where you can heat multiple buildings with uh, one boiler. Very. Uh, European, so to speak, because that's what exists in villages and towns throughout throughout Europe, particularly Austria, uh, Hungary, uh, Poland, Germany. Prisons. We have two prisons, and to be honest, here again, the Crescent and Greensburg have gone offline. All the prisoners from those, uh, the inmates from those two prisons have been taken up to the new facility at Rockview State Penitentiary near State College. But the reports I get is that the buildings are still there. Probably they're, they're going to get remodeled in three or five years. You'll see these come back online. I really have no authority to say that, but uh, it's just some uh, reports that I get from that, uh, from those two communities. So I'm hopeful. That's how I can leave it. I'm hoping that that's what they do. Utility scale power plants. Uh, some unique situations here. Viking Energy, just to show you the, uh, the dynamics of wood energy and other forms of energy. They've been mothballed 
mothballed for a couple years, probably in 2016, 2017, we may see that come back online, especially as gas prices continue to rise, and, and they are rising slowly. But uh, they were a standalone uh, utility power plant for PPL. Uh, took in a lot of wood chips, and that was a, a great benefit to the economy of the forest products industry in that north north central part of Pennsylvania. Piney Creek Waste Coal, they co-fire with the waste coal, and there's a benefit in doing that because coal doesn't, or excuse me, wood does not have sulfur. So when you introduce that as a fuel in your combustion chamber, you see uh, an immediate drop in your sulfur dioxide uh, uh, emissions. Coppers, unique situation there, they manufacture, they, they creosote treat new railroad ties that, are, that they manufacture. Subsequently, or, or consequently, they also uh, recycle old railroad ties, they burn it to produce 12 megawatts of electricity for PPL. Earlier this year, though, they decided to go with natural gas because the Marcellus gas is so readily available in that area. They uh, no longer use wood to generate that electricity or for their process, their treatment process. So I got a phone call anyway from North Shore uh, Short Line Railroad saying, what are we going to do with our old railroad ties? That's how we got rid of them. What are we going to do? We have to landfill them now. Well, they contacted Evergreen Community Power down in Reading, and the last I know, uh, Evergreen Power is going to take their railroad ties and start burning it in their production facility. They have 12 and a half megawatt generation there. It's at Corestack. Corestack produces, they recycle paper. They make it back into a craft paper for uh, corrugated cardboard. Uh, it's one of the few facilities in the state that has the emission controls. DEP gives them permission to burn C&D wood. That's construction and demolition wood out of Bucks County. They have the emission controls. They can take that uh, chemical or painted contaminated wood and, uh, and burn it to produce electricity. And that's, that's going to be a good use for <laughs> recycling railroad ties. And the last on the list is Gladfell or Pulpwood Company. They have a, a boiler, it's a fluidized, circulating fluidized bed boiler, uh, similar to what Evergreen Community has. And uh, uh, if you ever, if you want to know more about that technology, uh, fluidized bed boilers, give me a call and, and I'll go through an explanation of what I understand the fluidized bed boiler technology is. Very nice, very, uh, it's a large industrial type application. Uh, I recall back in the uh, uh, mid 1990s, a, a group of scientists were given a, a survey, put down 100 of the, of the most important technologies and, and inventions for the 20th century. Of course, uh, the polio vaccine, uh, Gemini space program, uh, Teflon, these are the computer, the personal computer, these were the things that were the best inventions of the 20th century. And the fluidized bed boiler was one of those because of what it meant for environmental cleanup, because streams could now be, be cleaned up, uh, improved from the waste coal uh, tailing or comb piles from the coal industry. Uh, very nice piece of technology. More on that in a different discussion though. I won't go through uh, too much of the rest of these lists other than to say that the, there are food, part of the food industry uses wood to energy. Uh, the cement plant, it's a cement kiln, kiln uses wood to heat their, their ovens to produce uh, cement. And there are a number of applications. We see a growing number of applications here in the community and government sectors where they're starting to take small boilers, small wood chip boilers or wood pellet boilers, and they're heating their facilities on a small commercial light industrial level, uh, getting away from those very large uh, million BTU an hour uh, energy plants. 
I'll show, show some pictures of that here uh, in a little bit. The wood industry, very quickly, of course, it makes sense. Everyone can understand this. Uh, you produce lumber or particle board, produce some type of forest product, you, you're going to have some residue, some waste, and uh, they have these lumber companies, sawmills, particle board, pulp wood plants have traditionally been very efficient in their use of their residue, as you can see. And by, by our accounts, you know, I, I can quickly give you 70 or 80, uh, but actually there are hundreds of these types of sawmill and, and forest product industry uh, applications in Pennsylvania, as you can see, and many more. Just very briefly talking about the uh, application of biomass energy in Pennsylvania, we have a very healthy number of wood pellet manufacturers. Energex at the top of the list is one of the largest, one of the largest east of the Mississippi. But there are others too that are uh, in various types of ownership and partnerships here, producing electric, uh, producing wood pellets for mostly residential use. That's uh, the 40 pound bags that you see at the hardware stores and the, the big box stores. Energex on this list though, something unique to, to point out, they are the only one that I've found willing to start delivering bulk making bulk delivery of wood pellets to a facility that has a grain bin, a storage hopper, that they can store their wood pellets and use it throughout the season. They get a couple uh, truckloads, tractor trailer loads of wood pellets at the beginning of the heating season, and it takes them throughout the year. Uh, terrific opportunity, what this means for biomass energy on a, on a light commercial, small commercial scale. So, continuing up, getting away from that list, just some early examples of what it meant for some of these facilities to install wood chip boilers, replacing some of the fossil fuels you see. <clears throat> Mountain View School District, they've been using wood chips since 19, uh, early 1990s to heat two schools. And $131,000 a year savings because they, they avoided higher fuel costs is a significant amount of money. That's a nice, healthy number to take to your school board and say that, look, this is what we're saving per year. These other examples, uh, $300,000 at Elk Regional, they're not saving quite that now because they switch back and forth since natural gas prices dropped. But as they start to go back up, I can see some uh, economy savings, economic savings there for that hospital in the future. <clears throat> An example, go through some of the details of Sullivan County High School, what it meant for that school, just as an example. And the other schools on the list can, you know, they can share similar uh, results as, as Sullivan County. But just to give you an example, it's a school up in the, the wood basket of Pennsylvania, north central Pennsylvania. Heat and hot water. What's important for a school or any application is to provide 85% of the heat. Size the boiler correctly, in other words. Don't put in 100% of your need, of, of your full capacity need. Size the boiler to 85% and then rely on your alternative form of energy. You have an old oil boiler or a gas boiler, rely on that to provide the peak load or uh, uh, shoulder months, what you need during the shoulder months to heat your facility. <clears throat> this can, can result in a significant saving. Sullivan County, for instance, their peak load between you know that 85 and 100 percent, that peak demand uh, amounted to about 18 hours a winter. That's like three days where they actually had such cold days that they needed 100 uh, percent capacity. Otherwise, save yourself money, put in a smaller boiler, at 85% uh, of what you need. When you have those really cold days in the winter, just kick in your, your old oil heater and, and provide that peak demand that you need. During the shoulder months, don't, 
don't rely on turndown ratio to run your wood chip boiler to, to satisfy your heating needs because you're, you're running very inefficiently. Solid fuel boilers, uh, solid fuel combustion, like these wood chip boilers, they run best when you run them as hard as you can. So during those shoulder months when you need cooler, temp or cooler heat, so to speak, rely on your alternative means, your oil heat or your gas boiler. Turn those back on to satisfy what you need for those cooler days in the winter. Sullivan County uh, had significant savings. Uh, they displaced 46,000 gallons of, of fuel oil. Their wood chips came from a sustainably harvested sawmill. It's, it's green certified, FSC certified sawmill. So they are, they are burning a, a certified green chip. Something we don't do here in Pennsylvania, something I don't do enough of, is to point out the emissions uh, uh, improvements with the, by using these wood chip boilers. By displacing fuel oil, they effectively eliminate 830 pounds per year of sulfur dioxide, and they'll have a net reduction over time of a million pounds per year of CO2 because they're using this alternative form of energy. That's something I, I need to calculate for all of the wood energy systems in the state and come up with a number that uh, I think we'll find is most impressive. These projects, they have, you can have automated uh, chip delivery systems and uh, de-ashing systems. Sullivan County has a, a fairly large wood, uh, wood chip storage bunker. I'll show you pictures here shortly. It was a, almost a 3 million BTU an hour uh, wood gasification unit. And uh, it, it's unique in that it has a hot water storage tank, a 3,000 gallon insulated uh, storage tank that the boiler now feeds with hot water. So that boiler realizes a steady state uh, operation where it is, it is humming along, producing hot water, feeding it into that hot water storage tank. When the school demands heat, they circulate that hot water out of that tank. So if you can imagine, the boiler does not react every time somebody turns a thermostat over in the school, that boiler does not react to that demand. It continues steady state, producing hot water, but instead the ther thermal storage tank now empties itself a little bit to respond to that, that demand. That is good for the boiler. That increases boiler efficiency and that's good over the overall life of the boiler, that it doesn't have to ramp up and ramp down, ramp up and ramp down to, to meet the demands of that, of that school. Uh, much better uh, thermal hot water storage. We're just beginning to use, see more and more of that application in Pennsylvania, and it's going to be a good thing for the actual equipment, the boiler equipment. Some more of the benefits, I think uh, I've already touched on some of these. Automated, clean, efficient, renewable, carbon neutral. They, they enjoyed some uh, good cost savings and they continued to, to do so. Here's a picture of what their power plant looked like. Uh, uh, as you face that red wall, the school is behind, uh, behind us, about 50 feet away. You can see in front of the tour bus, we had a number of tours. There's the garage where the walking floor trailer backs up to, <coughs> excuse me, to, the, uh, to the, the pit, and it dumps down into a bin. Behind that sawdust, or that wood chip pile, you see that metal coffer dam, that metal wall. Well, down below, lower left, Opposed twin screw, opposing screw uh, augers feed the chips out from underneath that pile of wood chips onto a rubber conveyor and it goes on its way up to the boiler through that in inclined conveyor belt. You can see the silver storage tank over on your right, that one picture, that's that 3,000 gallon tank. 
But those wood chips are headed over toward the, the front of the boiler, that red section of the boiler, where they are burned in the bottom of the box. The heat exchange is in that red portion of the boiler up top. And uh, you can see part of the dumpster here on the lower bottom right. <coughs> the dumpster is uh, probably 50 gallon, 50 plus gallons of, of uh, ash coming out of the bottom of that boiler. Screw augers give automatic ash uh, de-ashing capability to that boiler. The operator doesn't have to, to handle uh, scraping ash out of his boiler, and then they dispose of that. The ash, I, I want to point out, the question always comes up, you know, what do you do with the ash? Do you have to landfill it? And no, you do not, because it's potash. It's just the combustion of wood produces a low-grade fertilizer that we have known traditionally as potash, and that can be land applied. Many of the schools actually do. They put it on their soccer fields or their football fields and to help grass production. Let's move on to East Lycoming School District. I mentioned they're a progressive uh, school. They have solar panels. They have wood chip boiler. They're growing their own wood. Uh, about three quarters of their thermal load is is handled by that boiler, and they're still using wood or uh, they're using natural gas as their backup uh, fuel. It was a nice project. Many of these schools, you can see the, the eight hundred thousand dollar grant. Many of the schools receive some type of grant assistance to install their boilers. This particular boiler was installed as part of an ESCO process, energy service company. Uh, the school had to do something with their auditorium. They had to bump out the wall. Well, they took the opportunity to excavate, create a boiler room, and they, they made the boiler, wood chip boiler, as part of that energy service company. It's a guaranteed energy savings uh, for that school district. It's a Messersmith boiler manufactured in Michigan. That's the bottom black portion. And on top is a Hearst boiler. They're made in, down in Georgia. And assemble it. You can see the assembly here at, at the bottom right. Very nice operation. Does not have all the bells and whistles that other school districts have. But it's uh, for that school. They, they decided uh, it is what they, what they needed. Uh, much simpler in design and, and uh, operation. Picture here in 2012 of their hybrid willow plantation on the right. There, the, you see the corn in comparison what the what the two look like. Successful, uh, it's a successful project. One nice thing I, I like to point out with the, the hybrid willow there, what you're seeing here in this picture was a uh, it's a plantation, two and a half acre plantation on PPL's uh, Washingtonville power plant. It's called the Montour Preserve. I walked through there and it was this time of year, about five, six years ago. And you can see, you can make out the flowers on that, on the willow. The bees were, were loaded on this plantation. The place just hummed. Bees were crawling all over those flowers and they were so intent on what they were doing. I, I could push the bees off of the flower and they would just crawl back up. They ignored me. They were not interested in me. They were in their heaven. The, the thing I like to point out here, and I need to talk to people at Penn State, here is a terrific research opportunity to look at plantations, say 50 acres that, that Hughesville School District, uh, East Lycoming School District has, to look at 50 acres of willow flowers with bees on them. What does that mean to the pollinator population, the pollinator community out there. You know about uh, the sudden colony collapse, the problems with uh, bees, the beekeepers are having keeping their their plantation or their uh, their uh, hives healthy, their population of bees healthy. What does that mean if we can start planting hundreds of acres of, of potential fuel, a future fuel, in the meantime as it continues to, to grow, what we can do, what benefit we can have to the bee population by growing healthy bees on these on these uh, hybrid willow flowers. Fantastic opportunity, I think. It needs more research. Penns Valley, near State College, just east of State College. Very nice application. Look at a picture of their, their boiler house. Uh, that 
is, uh, I like to call it, you know, the glass and brass technology. They put in all these windows. It's, it, you know, at night, anyone can drive up to that window and look in to their lighted boiler room. It's a fabulous education opportunity. <clears throat> a very nice installation, as you're going to see. Look at all the room that they have. In the upper left, behind the glass, that's where the wood chips are stored. Then they convey them through the blue tube right into the front of the boiler. <coughs> the black structure that you see right in the middle of the one lower photo is their cyclone precipitator, where they're knocking the, the fly ash out of uh, their exhaust or their emissions or their exhaust. And then they gather that up in a small dumpster. And then, of course, the exhaust goes out that silver smokestack right there in front of you. Very nice uh, installation. They did it as a showpiece. The school district wanted to do this as a showpiece to demonstrate to the public any visitors, any tours that come. This is what biomass energy is, and they succeeded uh, very nicely. This is a, one of the most beautiful uh, installations in the state. Northern Bedford is the newest school, uh, one of the newest school. Northern Bradford School District also has a, a boiler. They both came online around the same time. But I, I throw this in here, you know, some of the pictures. There's a AFS energy system manufactured down in Lemoyne, just west of Harrisburg. Uh, very nice installation. But I impress upon you, look at how clean these boiler rooms are. Not like boiler rooms in the past that were, you know, dusty, dingy, ill-lit. Very nice applications. Northern Bedford, too, is interested in demonstrating. They want to show people. What's nice about Northern Bedford, here's a potential project. They have uh, 280 acres, I believe, of uh, farmland. They have a uh, Bo Ag program at the school. The, the interest is <clears throat> how can we fund them to get them to plant hybrid willow to start doing what, what Hughesville is doing. Plus, they can incorporate that into an education process, into a curriculum with their Bo Ag uh, uh, students. Very nice potential here at Northern Bedford. We have that potential at many of the schools. I, 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 let me say all of the schools, probably, to incorporate biomass energy, alternative energy processes into their, their uh, education curriculum. Twin Springs Fruit Farm, just west of uh, Gettysburg, a little town, a little village of Ortana. This shows the hoop houses that they heat Greenhouses, all of their produce year-round, every weekend goes down to Washington, D.C. Uh, they service, they feed seven of the open, uh, open air fruit and vegetable markets down in, uh, in Washington, D.C. That's the inner beltway. Very nice production, very nice facility. Some of the, and, and apples, they grow lots of apples. That's right in that uh, Musselman's uh, <clears throat> Apple uh, section of uh, South Central Pennsylvania. This is their new boiler plant. The right side of the boiler of uh, this facility is their wood chip storage facility, and behind the white garage door is their uh, is their boiler room. Here's what the upper part looks like. These open stalls. They deliver the wood chips and feed them down into the bunk uh, the bunker storage. I'll show you pictures here. Keep in mind, <clears throat> this is an agricultural setting. Uh, the people that work in these, you know, the, the uh, greenhouse operators, people in the agricultural community, their systems you're going to notice are very hands-on oriented. They have front-end loaders. They they are accustomed to cables and using motors and winches to uh, do their farm processes. This is a hands-on type of boiler installation, as you're going to see. Put the wood chips in this hopper, and it feeds up to this uh, uh, blue conveyor belt. And that conveyor belt is actually a cattle feed uh, conveyor, <clears throat> where uh, in the upper, toward the upper right, you'll see there's a plow where the wood chips will crash into that plow and dump down onto the plow of wood chips. They burn. 100% uh, ground up wood pallets. Wood pallets are kiln dried lumber, uh, shipping pallets, you know what they look like. 
The uh, DEP has given them permission to burn these ground up wood pallets because they get it from a sole source. Uh, one pallet recycler, manufacturer, uh, they chip up only clean pallets. DEP is uh, aware of what they're doing and so they gave uh, Twin Springs Fruit Farm permission to burn that. Because it is, keep this in mind, you're going to see in the next pictures, because it is kiln dried material, it's dusty, it's, uh, it's a uh, uh, more volatile uh, fuel, and you have to handle it uh, accordingly. Let me, let me show you here what I'm talking about. Front end loaders, they, they took in uh, all of their wood supply for the winter in this bunker because they were concerned they're up on the hill, snow country, right at that elevation, they get dumped on uh, throughout the winter. Maybe they could not, they would reach a point where they couldn't get the, the uh, delivery truck to their facility. So they wanted to make sure they had ample storage uh, fuel. They load it into conveyors that dump into these day hoppers and the fuel goes into their boiler room right next, <clears throat> right next door. Notice the dust that's accumulating on their equipment. So it's a, it's a housekeeping issue. Uh, they have to have more maintenance than a school, which uses a green chip, very clean, you know, it's moist, 45% moisture content. This material is probably 19 to 25% moisture content, so it's, it's much dustier. This is a blue flame stoker manufactured up in Canada. It's an older form of technology, older line of boiler. Uh, because of what, oh, let me go back. Because of uh, the avoided fuel costs, they displaced coal, which is less expensive than wood, but they had a disposal problem, and they were using four boilers that were not designed for the amount of use they were receiving, so they are wearing them out. But uh, what it meant uh, for this greenhouse, because of the avoided fuel costs and uh, some other operating costs, they could actually double, almost double, their greenhouse capacity because of the fuel savings. So, uh, and they have increased efficiency, so they can afford to put in more greenhouses and they uh, essentially will double because of the new, newer technologies, newer greenhouse technology, they'll double their, their vegetable uh, production and this wood energy actually meant a, a positive increase in their bottom line as a company. Oh, going the wrong way. Bear with me a little bit here. Okay, I mentioned earlier, uh, just a few more slides left here. I mentioned earlier about smaller applications, uh, wood chip boilers, pellet boilers, smaller application for light commercial, small commercial uh, installations. The Cooperage up in Honesdale, they took an old barrel plant, they repurposed it so that it's a community building. At, on the bottom they have a, a kitchen, they have a stage, meeting rooms, where the community can actually come and use this facility. Upstairs they have a, a radio station, uh, there's an environmental group renting office space, and then they have their boiler. They have two Okafins, the, the green and white uh, 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 boilers that you see there, burning pellets and pr producing enough heat for this 7,000 square foot building. The fuel is, is stored in the super sack that you see in the bottom left. Very nice application. When it comes time to install the super sack, you put the two by sixes on your shoulder, you walk upstairs, you assemble them, hang the fabric bag. Energex comes and delivers bulk, gives them a bulk delivery of uh, fuel for the winter, pneumatically blowing them up into the second story through the window of their second story, uh, just like a vacuum cleaner, you know, reverse vacuum cleaner. Flexible hose, blow it right into the storage. They have two of these sitting side by side, so they receive about 14 tons for the winter to heat this facility. This is a, th this type of installation is the biggest potential for biomass energy in the Commonwealth. 
This is what we, in my opinion, the wood energy, biomass energy initiative in Pennsylvania is going to go this route where we see more of these European style residential units, light commercial uh, boiler units burning pellets or in, and even wood chips. It's uh, got to be a, a drier wood chip, 35% moisture content or less. But uh, this is the greatest potential for biomass energy because the costs, instead of looking at a million dollar plus installation, we're looking at uh, less than $100,000 to put in one of these type of uh, light commercial business applications. Even smaller, one of the Okafins there, just that single unit is anywhere between fifteen dollars and $22,000 uh, with you know, all the other peripheral accessories. A little expensive for the residential unit, uh, for a, a typical homeowner, but uh, there are, we have some of these installed in Pennsylvania. Wiser State Forest, this, this is one of the uh, applications I'm talking about. Resource Management Center, 15,000 square feet. That building on the upper left is their Resource Management Center, their office. It's a LEED certified. All of these are LEED certified uh, uh, buildings. The, the bottom right, and I, I can see here it's a little fuzzy, it's a little out of focus, but in the back you can see the, uh, the uh, uh, Brock bin, grain bin. Yeah, there it is. Uh, 30 tons carries them, about 25 tons actually carries them through the winter. They heat not only the uh, five bay maintenance garage, but also that uh, office building in the, in the background. They, they just completed this uh, past winter. They've completed construction. You can see the two red, red and black units. Those are Froilings. They're Austrian made, uh, both residential size. They're the P4 100 series. Uh, we don't have thermal storage per se in this application. However, the buildings, both buildings, have in-floor radiant heat. So you've got the, the red or the PEX tubing in the floor. That actually acts as thermal storage for, uh, for heating the cement mass, the floor, and that gives you that uh, nice warm feeling coming up through the floor. So. We, we can see the, the DCNR Bureau of Forestry is committed to seeing more of these applications in their new resource management centers. We have 20 forest districts. Uh, probably in the next uh, few years, I can see five of our forest districts installing some type of uh, pellet boiler, as you see here. And there are many. There are many different companies producing these uh, units in the, in the range of 130 to 300,000 BTUs an hour. Uh, at one time, that was a, a problem, say four or five years ago, finding biomass systems in the 500 to 1 million BTU per hour range. We just, we didn't have them. Uh, people weren't manufacturing. If you wanted to burn wood chips, you had to be a school that burned a 1.5 million BTU system, uh, you know, had a, a larger million, multi-million uh, million BTU an hour system installed. But uh, these smaller systems, they satisfy that 100 to 750, 900,000 BTU an hour requirement that small commercial, uh, light industrial applications require. There's the back end of the boiler and here's the uh, picture of the, main, uh, the uh, maintenance garage that we're heating. It's a nice setup, very nice application. Everybody loves that radiant floor heat. The Woodmaster Flex Fuel Series, uh, Caledonia State Park had such an installation. This is uh, looking at an installation near uh, Chambersburg, but that gives you a good picture of what the Woodmaster Flex Fuel. It can burn cord wood, or you can switch it out uh, relatively easily and burn pellets. And it's connected to hot water thermal storage, as you see, the 450 gallon tank in the background. Here's what the Caledonia State Parks looks like. Uh, got a little reflection off the front of that boiler, but the black unit on the to, immediately to the right is the pellet day hopper. And in the back, the bigger black tank, that's hot water thermal storage. Behind that wall, there's three other tanks. So we have four tanks, about 1,300 uh, gallons of hot water thermal storage to heat this maintenance garage and also the uh, uh, Pennsylvania Firefighters Museum, 
which uh, I don't think I included a picture, but it's a small stone cabin <coughs> there at Caledonia, just to the right of, of these pictures. So we're heating two buildings with this uh, flex fuel boiler. Sorry. And uh, they can burn cordwood. The uh, early premise of, uh, of uh, why they wanted to burn wood was because they had so much hazard wood that they have to cut along the roads and trails. So as they cut it, they thought, instead of burning number two fuel at close to $4 a, a gallon, let's burn our own fuel. <coughs> and you can see in the one picture the uh, polycarbonate, eight and a half ton wood pellet storage tank that uh, they, they feed with a flexible auger. It's a flexible screw auger feeds into the boiler, that black, uh, small black tank uh, as they need it. All right, moving on. And uh, their delivery, this was the Energex uh, Pellet Express. This is how they delivered bulk, made bulk deliveries of wood pellets. Actually, they have a bigger truck now, but uh, kind of a cute shot. Woodmaster also has a, a, another line of boilers. This is that commercial series, small commercial, light industrial application, the pellet boiler on the left, the wood chip boiler on the right. The wood chip boiler, that wood chip has to be 35% moisture or less for it to work adequately. But this is the, uh, you know, these are about five feet tall to give you a sense of scale. This, this is a, a huge potential. I'm working with six clients right now in Pennsylvania. This is the, the size boiler that all six of those will probably take for their applications. One, uh, two greenhouses, uh, a uh, feed, feed mill down near Philadelphia, and uh, I have a sawmill that's interested in, uh, in uh, heating their facility with wood chips. So terrific potential with, uh, with these types of boilers. This is manufactured. These are, this is an Italian design. These were originally made in Italy. And then the controls, uh, electronic controls, computer automation, that was Swedish. And the, the company, A Bionova, came over from Sweden to, to Minnesota. And they, they manufacture these now in Minnesota at uh, Red Lake Mill. Uh, I think I have that, Red Lake, uh, Minnesota where they, they make these and the other flex fuel. They make a larger Biomax, if you ever hear that name. The Biomax series is uh, the larger uh, wood chip boilers. Terrific potential for Pennsylvania. The Kub boiler in Germany, very quickly, Wiesmann Manufacturing um, sells these, distributes these out of Warwick, Rhode Island. <clears throat> Some of the assembly is up in Canada. So again, European technology works. The one on the left is for pellets or or low moisture uh, wood. The one on the right, the Pyrotech, is a standard wood chip, you know, the 50% moisture uh, wood chip. We have one of those installed down in Farmington, Fayette County, at the Bruderhof. It's a religious community. Uh, very nice. These are very nice uh, German boilers. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to move on. Oh, that was the end. Uh, I have some time for questions. I see some of you have been typing. Uh, we have uh, almost, what, six or eight minutes. Uh, we'll entertain some uh, questions. If you have other concerns or questions in the future, there's my contact information. Uh, Sarah, how do we... Uh... Um, yeah, so uh, it looks like a few people are typing in their questions now. Um, I wanted to start with a question of my own, if that's all right. So um, one of the biggest barriers to implementing these systems, especially at larger scales, are the high capital costs. Um, in your experience with these projects that you've worked with, can you talk about some of the incentives and tax breaks or grants in the state or at a broader scale that can help these projects go forward and deal with some of those capital costs? Yes, a very good question. Uh, the, the schools and hospitals, for instance, the greenhouses, Generally, I, I can't think of any of them that have not taken advantage of grants. Currently, we have, and this is just, this is timely. The, your question is timely because there are four or five grants open just recently. Uh, 
the, the Department of Community and Economic Development had the ACE grant, the Alternative Clean Energy Grant. They meet, that board meets every quarter. Uh, you can apply year round, uh, every quarter. You can apply, uh, you send your proposal to them. They will pay for it currently up to about 35% of the actual boiler, uh, the appliance, like, like what you see in front of you. Uh, many of the schools have done that, especially when, when uh, the president had the ARRA money available. Uh, uh, the ARRA money uh, funded, uh, they would give out $800,000 grants to some of these. The uh, ACE grant is still available. PETA, the Pennsylvania Energy Development Authority, just announced uh, last two weeks ago, they are coming out with their grant once again. That's a DEP uh, uh, that's housed within DEP. That grant will come out in June, and I think we have 60 days to respond. So that is uh, uh, available. Uh, the NRCS, federal funding through the NRCS, has come out with, again, with uh, an announcement for the REAP grant, Rural Energy in America program, where companies can, especially if they have some type of application to the ag, uh, some benefit to the ag community or the forest products community, uh, they can, uh, the applicant can go after funding for, for that, for a boiler system. They'll actually fund solar, wind, and biomass alternative energy projects. So there's three. Uh, the U.S. Forest Service traditionally has had funding for a, what they used to call the Woody Biomass Energy Program. Uh, it's something a little different this year. Uh, that and that's open right now. But the, the, that application, it would be for schools or communities up around within 100 miles of the Allegheny National Forest. Uh, they were, a, an installation, a project there would have to show that some of the wood fuel was coming off the Allegheny National Forest. Out west, what they're trying to do is address a lot of the mortality that they have out west for that kind of funding. Um, the NRCS also had the Conservation Innovative Grant. That closed for Pennsylvania back early uh, April, uh, early March, I believe. Uh, but there are there's a list of other eight, nine, ten states that are still open throughout the year. So there are projects. Uh, some of these schools, like I said, there was uh, Sullivan County, $1.65 million project. They received $1.1 or $1.2 million in grants or low interest loans. Uh, one more thing to say, Sustainable Energy Fund. A Sustainable Energy Fund in Allentown has low interest loans. Actually, they this recent offering was 0% interest. What's nice about the Sustainable Energy Fund is they are willing to take a third party position. So in if, if, a, <clears throat> if an installation, you know, a project at a greenhouse, for instance, went belly up, they couldn't continue through, well, they would take that low interest loan or 0% loan, convert it into a grant and say, well, here, if this was a grant, we'll take a loss on this, uh, this uh, bad project and we'll continue on. So they're willing to work with people, providing as much opportunity for them as possible. The sustainable energy funds, there's four of them in the state, and uh, basically when the utilities were deregulated, PUC required the utilities to put ratepayer support uh, uh, surcharge, put that into a special fund for alternative energy applications, and that's where this body of money. West Penn Power has some uh, the foundation for the Allegheny uh, Penelec, they have some funding. Sustainable Energy Fund in Allentown is PPL. PICO has uh, another sustainable energy fund. So that, that's a terrific opportunity for low interest loans. I yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, that was a pretty exhaustive list. And um, I think you, the, how impressed we are with that robust list leads to the next question that's come up in the chat pod. Um, which is that it seems like there's a lot of activity, um, this participant points out, but little awareness. And I'm, I'm curious if you kind of have a read on, on why that, that might be true or if you agree with that statement. Um, why so? Well, there is a lot of activity. Why so little awareness? I guess that depends on the, uh, the circle of friends that you run around in. 
is there a comprehensive list available? Um, uh, yes and no. And it, it's part of the issue, part of the problem is uh, these funds come out at such different times or at, like PETA, you won't see that funding opportunity. For, I think the last one was in 2010 that they had a, uh, they were receiving proposals. So the, the funds come and go. Uh, the Woody Biomass Utilization Grant changed, but it was the U.S. Forest Service. That was always coming out in, in early uh, March, or it, deadline was always, I think, early April. So, you know, it's out there. It, it would behoove groups like uh, the Fuels for Schools or uh, the Pennsylvania Biomass Energy Association to start keeping a, a list, active list on their website of what is available, what, what is out there. But it's, uh, it becomes old information very quickly because, as I say, PETA has not offered anything for some time. DEP has a very nice website that lists all of the grants that are available from them. But it's, you know, it's clean streams grants, it's uh, air emission grants, it's uh, alternative energy grants. There's a lot of different uh, funds, grant opportunities, and loan opportunities that they offer. DCNR has a, a list too, but it's, it also includes other things like the community recreation grants. So uh, there, you're, you're right in that there is not one central website that lists comprehensively all of the different grants and funds available. Uh, yeah, I, c I can see how, um, especially for an institution with a very specific funding schedule, um, if those aren't in alignment with when those grants are coming out, it can be hard maybe to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I see one of the other questions is, uh, uh, in terms of biomass using facilities, uh, is there a comprehensive list? That's what I'm trying to do here today. I give this talk frequently. Uh, what we're working on with the Pennsylvania Fuels for Schools and Communities is to get this list on our website, but actually produce a publication that shows all of the details of each of those installations what was their previous fuel, how much biomass wood chip do they use per year, uh, what kind of production size buildings, number of buildings that they heat. Give details in a spreadsheet uh, and put that online, publish that as a document to, to increase the awareness that, that uh, other potential clients or customers might appreciate to see, oh yes, there's 12 other schools using this in the state. So uh, you know, that's something we're working on. Yeah, that sounds like an excellent resource and one that would certainly be of interest to uh, the participants today and, and others in our, in our arena of outreach for sure. So um, I think we're coming to the end here. Uh, I know we're a bit over time, but does anyone else have any other questions for Mike? Um, thank you so much, Mike. This has been a really great overview of the program and I appreciate your contribution very much to our webinar series. Uh, you're welcome. And uh, again, here's my contact information. <clears throat> if, if people have further questions, uh, feel free uh, to give me, give me a call. I cover the state, so I'm available to come to your location if you have questions or uh, someone wants to, a group wants to hear this presentation.